whatever ai learns it is based on the data that humans produce through their real actions in the world ai then uses that data and says oh okay this is how humans behave so let me help them produce more data so you know it's a circle that we are in where technology and humans interact with each other to produce more and more data welcome to your intended message the perfect place for leaders and promising professionals who want to convey the intended message for greater success every week we interview experts who address the challenges and best practices to deliver your message effectively that might be one to one one to few or one to many and perhaps the most important conversation, one to self. I'm your host, George Torok. My guest today is Manoj Agarwal. Here's three facts that I think you should know about him. One, he is a global thought leader who has been working with AI for 15 years. He holds four patents in AI. His clients have included Microsoft, IBM, Pearson Education, and many more, while producing over $500 million in value for those clients. Two, his work has been referenced by President Obama and Bill Gates. I think you heard of them. And three, at the age of 15, he started working 12 hours a day in a factory, making $2 a day. Humble beginnings. Manoj Agarwal, welcome to your intended message. Thank you so much. Thanks. Excited to be here. Delighted to be talking with you. And yes, there must be a tremendous amount of lessons getting from that $2 start, which Absolutely. just shows that everyone starts somewhere. And it doesn't matter where we started. It's where we yeah, go with it. Exactly. We're here today to explore the opportunities, maybe the threats in AI. And I understand that you also a computer understanding, but you also bring an understanding of human psychology to your work as well. Yeah. And I'm wondering, are you see, do you see AI thinking like humans? Is that happening? Is that possible? Well, I mean, if you think about it, uh, AI and uh, human uh, psychology, they are interlinked because whatever AI learns, it is based on the data that humans produce through their real actions in the world. So whatever the humans are, are doing or producing or, you know, however they are behaving, that data gets captured and is used to train AI. And then AI itself then uses that data and says, oh, okay, this is how humans behave. So let me help them produce more data. So, you know, it's a circle that we are in where technology and humans interact with each other to produce more and more data. A second thing I will say is like, if you're using iPhone or any other modern smartphone, uh, everything on that device is controlled by AI. And the reason why we are using it is because every app is sort of feeding our desire to either connect or entertain or just do whatever we feel like doing in our life. And it's deeply, deeply linked with the, our psychology, individual psychology. And so what I'm believing is that it's because people, human beings are writing the software and therefore they're putting in maybe a part of the personality, but certainly they're thinking probably their biases and certainly the logical sequences they have. So it's only natural that AI would get human. Yeah. Some people feel threatened by AI. Should they? Well, um, humans behave uh, similarly to any new paradigm shift. So, you know, when the printing press came in, People were afraid what is going to happen when information gets dispersed to the masses. When the internet came, uh, some of you may remember there was a Y2K scare where people started running to uh, the grocery stores and buying up all the toilet papers. This is nothing new. Like when the car was invented, people said, oh, this is the devil's vehicle because it was, you know, it's it used to spew out uh, the smoke. So a lot of uh, these reactions are very, very similar. 
Uh, the fact is that AI is already here. This is not something new. Um, and it is, as I said, like, you know, you take out your smartphone and everything on that device is already controlled by AI. AI is being a tool. It is here to help us be more productive and, you know, uh, solve many complex problems that we haven't been able to solve with our human intellect. But uh, yes, every technology has the potential to be misused as well. But if you think about it, it's not the technology that causes the harm. It's always the humans using the technology. So I tell people that, uh, you know, you should be uh, focused on doing more good with the technology. And if you do more good, it will sort of uh, overpower some potential bad actors that are always going to be there as, as part of human equation. Mm. And the thought that just occurred to me, just as gunpowder was a positive invention because it allowed us to blow up rocks and make roads and clear property, but it also was used as a weapon as well. So it could go either way. Exactly, exactly. I mean, again, you know, as humans, we tend to weaponize pretty much every technology that we can get our hands on. But you have to realize that 95% of what happens in the world is all for good purpose, not for bad uh, intentions. Mm. And I'm curious about some of the work that, if you're allowed to talk about it, that you did with some of the large corporations, what sort of issues were they coming to you and how were you addressing that? A uh, technology uh, solves all kinds of problems. For example, you know, first, first and foremost, keeping track of your data, keeping track of your daily workflows, keeping track of, let's say you have deployed several thousand machines in the field and you need to maintain them. Now you need to figure out, you know, how often do you need to maintain them? How, what is the cost and all of that? So there are various problems that, you know, we are using AI, for example, to teach uh, music. So uh, we are using AI to help students get better education. We are using AI for patients to get personalized healthcare, uh, which is applicable to them, minimize, uh, minimizing their side effects and those type of things. We are using 3D printing and AI to create uh, custom experiences, custom orthotic devices for patients. So there is an endless uh, list of things that uh, technology can help solve. and. Uh, our focus is to find those interesting problems and solve them. And what are the type of problems that AI is best suited to solving? Well, right now, for example, AI, we are not there uh, with the artificial general intelligence. So AI is pretty good at solving one specific type of problem. So if you're doing something repetitively, uh, let's say, you know, 10 times a day, 100 times a day, you know, taking orders, answering emails, answering phone calls, these type of things we can offload to AI because it reduces the reliance on humans. Like ju just humans are sometimes not very well suited, for example, uh, driving, right? I just came back from uh, San Francisco and there are uh, literally driverless cars in the city, uh, which you can just hop on, just like uh, calling an Uber, they have better track record than human drivers because, I mean, humans are uh, not very attentive at all times. We have a lot of emotional sort of reactions to things. Uh, if uh, you wake up and you had a fight with your spouse, your ability to discern uh, everything that is going on on the street will be affected by that emotional uh, response. So all of these things uh, we have to take into account. At the same time, we also have to address like, okay, you know, if everything is done by AI, like what are humans going to do? And um, the idea here again is like the repetitive tasks, which we have sort of come to know as our job that can be offloaded to AI. But what that will produce is uh, more time for us to focus on more creative efforts, more efforts where we can uh, really understand human needs for uh, what people are looking for. I'll give you an example. I was talking to a neurosurgeon and they said that 80% of their time goes into administrative work, like entering data about the patient and things of that nature. So imagine all that overhead is offloaded to AI. That'll free up so much more time for the neuroscientists and, and physicians to focus on caring for the patients. Mm, and that sounds like a huge gain there. I had no idea that neurosurgeons would spend 80% of the time on admin. Yeah. Ah, oh, it's a waste of time. 
Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm. Now, you mentioned people are more suited for the creative process. And in fact, just earlier today, I visited our famous chat GTP uh, because I'm writing a, writing an article and I wanted some ideas. So I asked a few sets of questions. I asked for a list of questions. Oh, I was talking about creating humor. And so I asked for, uh, give me humorous quote. Give me a list of humorous quotes from famous people. And then I look for that. Okay. Now give me some, um, some humorous lines from movies that, you know, so I'm gathering and I'm, and I'm looking down the list and I go, okay, that one I can use. I can use that one there and I can use that one there. And, and so it was stimulating me and helping me write. It wasn't writing for me. Um, I suppose I could have asked it to write, but then when you do that, you can tell that it's been written by AI. Uh, yeah. So it's, it yeah. becomes a tool. Absolutely. It's just like, uh, uh, any other tool like your car or uh, you know your stove or anything like that i mean you can let it do its thing let's say if, if you turn on the car and said okay uh, I, i'm talking about this self driving car as well like you know these are very sophisticated devices but if you just say okay take me anywhere it's going to say what do you mean by take me anywhere just same thing with ai like you know you really need to initiate the thought initiate the creative uh, work that you want to do and then use it as a tool to really reflect your thoughts your tone your way of uh, communication otherwise yeah i mean everything becomes so bland and uh, watered down that your point doesn't come across what do you use ai for most to do for you See, as I said, like, you know, my company is focused on building custom solutions for businesses, finding those problem areas where technology and automation and AI can really make a difference. So we try to come up with our own way of solving a problem. So, you know, as I said, uh, I have patented technologies to my name. So which basically means that we do things that nobody else has done before. So, for example, you know, we're working with a corporation where they are uh, trying to manage a lot of complex infrastructure that they have deployed in the field. And in order to manage all that, people are spending like 20 hours a week uh, in meetings and spreadsheets and emails. And that's uh, not very good for productivity. Um, so with automation and AI, we can bring it down to maybe a couple of hours of meeting a week and, uh, you know, free up all that time for more growth oriented uh, activities for the company and so in order to do that we can not just use like off the shelf products like chat gpt even though like you know a bunch of that will be uh, used as well but then we also have to think about okay how do we get the data that is being produced within the corporation how do we uh, put it together how do we make sense of it how do we help people who are responsible for maintaining this infrastructure to like get the right uh, signal or get the right uh, notification at the right time so that they don't have to continuously monitor their email and say, oh, do I need to do something now? Is something that needs my attention now? Rather, you know, they can focus on what is important and then the system can tell them, look, there is possibly a, a maintenance issue at this location. So if you have a technician in the uh, field, please dispatch them or something along those lines. Hmm. And earlier you mentioned about AI keeping track of different types of machinery. And I was thinking about a, a delivery service, a company in the distribution where they have trucks on the road, they maybe different warehouses and distribute point. So all those trucks need maintenance. Mm-hmm. So they need to be tracked. Uh, how many hours are they running? And so that's something that I suppose you just give to, to an AI type concept and says, okay, schedule this truck for this time at this day, this truck at this maintenance, that that could all be done exactly, only, exactly. automatically. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Because especially now, even if you look at like, you know, basic uh, vehicles, we all have GPS in our cars and in our phones. So we know the location, we know, uh, you know, the speed, as you said, the number of hours it has been driven, all of that data is available. Like we, we don't really need a human to actually go and collect this data anymore. So when you combine all that, so many possibilities open up, like um, many of these vehicles now can start to talk to each other. You know, they can start to understand uh, where they are relative to each other and, and all of that stuff. I mean, there are many more interesting use cases. So as I was saying, like we are working with a music company and uh, their their goal is to teach music to stu- to millions and millions of students. 
Um, and they have come up with a very unique methodology to teach students uh, music using geometry, mathematics, uh, because music is all, I mean, at the end of the day, mathematics. The idea is that no matter how much they try, they cannot reach their goal to teach millions and millions of students because they just don't have enough teachers to teach. Uh, but if we implement AI, now the gift of music can be given to uh, tens of millions. And in fact, in my opinion, that is sort of the society that we are moving towards where creative endeavors, art, music, uh, these type of things will become much more valuable, much more visible. It's almost like a renaissance coming back uh, where in Europe, you know, in the 1500s, the, the people who were into creative fields, they were at the top of the society. Like they were uh, the ministers in the courts. Uh, they were, you know, paid the highest amount of money for their um, creative pursuits. These are the type of things which will come back again. What has surprised you the most about AI in, over your 15 years? I think every time I uh, work on a project, uh, it surprises me how uh, AI can surpass human uh, judgment, human performance. You know, we were working on a healthcare related project and um, the idea was to teach AI to diagnose some problems. We were working with like physicians who had like a couple of decades of experience on average, uh, 20 years of experience. And we used that insight to train AI and within uh, like, Within four weeks, AI was doing a better job than people, you know, these physicians who have been in the field for 20 years and before that 10, 12, 15 years of education. So you can imagine the level of surprise I had, uh, you know, just understanding the technology, but not really understanding the power that this technology has. And now we are growing at an exponential rate. So every day there is a surprise. Oh, I mean, you know, like now we can do this, now we can do this. So it's an exciting time, but it's also very surprising. The other aspect I'm very surprised at is this technology is also showing some divides in society. You know, obviously people worried and people excited about, you know, these are two camps that exist today. But also I find that when I talk to a lot of people involved in these technologies, there is one engineering mindset, which is focused on building the, the best technology out there. And then there is a human aspect, which is, okay, what are we going to actually do with this technology? How are we going to implement it? You know, what are the impacts of, um, you know, uh, job displacement and those type of things. And there's not a lot of overlap or um, there's not a lot of sort of uh, cohesive discussion around these two aspects either. And so, you know, I mean, it's a work in progress, but these are some of the things that I find interesting and surprising. Mm. Where do you see the opportunity for business today that they're not jumping on quick enough? This is exactly what I was talking about earlier, right? Like um, uh, a lot of people are just scratching the surface with, uh, oh, um, you know, let's use uh, AI to write more articles. Uh, let's use AI to write more emails. Of course, now you are just spamming other people's inbox. And then the question to ask is, why do you need to write that email in the first place? You know, can you really take off that drudgery of uh, doing this work off your plate and let somebody make a decision, which which is a simple decision? Uh, you know, I'm not talking about, uh, oh, we should use AI to like make uh, decisions, whether to cut off somebody's limbs or make decisions in like, you know, um, legal cases or something along those lines. But Simple things can be automated where if we just need to inform our coworker about project status or something along those lines, some of these things can be automated and removed from our workload. So we really need to start thinking about how AI can solve some real problems, which tend to fall in three categories. Save some time, help us save some money, or find areas to make more money. That's sort of the definition of becoming more productive. Right now, we are not thinking deep enough. We are just trying to automate the existing uh, flows that we have in our life. Of course, it will save money, but sometimes you also need to think whether we even need to do this step and can we just eliminate it altogether? Mm, good point. Many decades ago, when I was working in a small company, we purchased our first computer. It was an IBM PC 
Uh, and you might remember it was a 286, mm -hmm. eight, it, call it the advanced technology with two floppy drives, five and a half. And, and I volunteered to be the computer guy because I, I took computers at high school. So I volunteered and I remember, so I was asked to um, help prepare an order entry system for the computer. And so I went to the system that we had. And as I was going through the system, I realized that there were steps in there that were unnecessary. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But we wouldn't have discovered that unless we were gonna put it on the computer. Up yeah. to then, we just kept doing paperwork exactly. the same way. Yeah, yeah. And you will find that a lot in every organization, small or big, you know, when you start talking to them and you ask this question, okay, why are you doing it this way? And generally the answer is, this is how I, we have been doing it. Mm -hmm. So AI, if the only thing it does, is force us to ask is why are we doing this way? Yeah. Duh, I have no idea. Yeah. Th then it's worthwhile. Exactly. Mm. And you mentioned about self-driving cars. Did you sit in one of those cars? And let Not yet, I was waiting for like, so they have limited cars and they have like a, I was just a visitor to the city. So I had to wait for a event, uh, invite code and everything. I haven't received it yet. Maybe next time when I visit, maybe I'll. Mm. And if I understand right, airplanes have an AI. The pilot does very little. The pilot yeah. holds the controls during takeoff and landing, and the rest of the time they sleep or yeah. chit chat or whatever. The plane flies itself. Uh, so if we allow computers to fly airplanes, why not allow them to drive cars where there's only one plane versus yeah, yeah. the the whole uh, well there's an emotional connection to driving the act of driving is a personal experience for a lot of people so i can understand the resistance to some of these things but also the benefits of these things mm. what industries seem to be leading the way with exploring ai healthcare they're putting a lot of money and resources behind ai then uh, manufacturing is another one uh, finance technology meaning banking, insurance, these type of industries are putting a lot in. Unfortunately, like, you know, traditional industries like education are a little bit uh, behind. Um, construction uh, is a little bit behind. But uh, yeah, I mean, there are several industry reports um, that uh, that we can consume to, to figure this out. But yeah, I mean, finance, healthcare, these industries are leading the charge. Mm. How can AI serve government? Where can it work for government? I mean, if you look at it, like, you know, every government uh, process is really uh, complex due to heavy reliance on like paper-based systems and decisions take a lot of time. And there's a, there's a huge backlog of things. Like even we were talking about uh, earlier, like legal cases, like unfortunately, if you get in, involved in any legal case, it takes like years to get through. And if you think about it, like not every legal case is a very complex thing. I mean, of course, there are some very complex uh, legal cases, but 80% of the backlog are simple disputes. Some of these things can be supplemented, not actually like offloaded, but supplemented by AI. Some decisions, uh, let's say you want to build a home and uh, you want to apply to get a permit for uh, from the city. Many of these things can be just sort of uh, analyzed by automation and then the decision making by the human can be enhanced or augmented by these AI systems. So instead of taking months and months to review a plan and issue a permit, this activity can be brought down to like days or weeks. Typically, we think of computing as being yes or no answers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can AI venture beyond that and say, here's three, four possibilities to interpret or use that information? Can it do that? I think that's the realm we are entering now with ChatGPT. That's what uh, uh, you know got everyone excited, even though, as, as I said, like AI has been around for a long time. But now every day person uh, who does not have a background in technology can really feel and touch the same thing that you just mentioned. It's not just yes or no answer, but it is more like, okay, give me a creative way of thinking. And the interesting thing is it is not doing, if you input this, then I'll give you this. Because even if you ask the same question, you will never get the same answer. 
So it is actually doing that creative work. It is actually, you know, telling you, okay, maybe do this, maybe do that. Uh, so let's say if you say to AI uh, today, with, I'm, I'm specifically re referring to chat GPT or similar platforms. If you say, give me funny quotes, then you can say, make it funnier, make it more edgy, make it more sound intellectual, make it sound childish. You know, I was like, I have a teenage son. So I was like, okay, you know, tell me how I can communicate with my son using the language that the millennials use these days. Right. Uh, so it was kind of funny. It annoyed him because, you know, when I used that language, it, it actually <laughs> sounded like a teenager and it was annoying to him, but it was, these are the things that um, AI is able to do. And that's what people are excited about. Mm. What do you suggest to people who have a reluctance, maybe even a fear of introducing AI into their companies, into their business, into their sure. life? What do you suggest to them? I'll, I'll give you a few ideas um, to overcome. See, the world is changing. AI is already here. Uh, again, people think that, oh, this is coming now. No, AI has been around. I mean, how do you think you get uh, your package delivered the same day, next day when you order from Amazon? How do you think, you know, Elon Musk is landing those rockets back on on the ground. That's not somebody just sitting there and doing all these calculations by hand. Uh, it's AI. So uh, the key is that if you don't ride this uh, wave, if you don't embrace it, let me first give you some context uh, before I uh, use these statements. 1995, I logged into the internet for the first time using one of those 286, 386 computers that you were talking about earlier. And in 1998, I wanted to apply for an entry level job. Within three years, the world had changed so much that in 1998, if I didn't have an email address, then I could not apply even for an entry level job. Right. So in three years, that's how much the world had changed. And if you recall, like even just maybe 10, 15 years ago, they, I mean, smartphone was introduced in 2007. OK, so now imagine if you refuse to use smartphone, how far do you get in life? Uh, so the choice is yours. You want to embrace this technology, which, by the way, is going to add about $10,000 billion to the world economy in the next seven years. So if you want to stay on the sidelines and not take advantage of that opportunity, that's understandable sometimes. But on the flip side, and these are not my words, this is the word. These are the words of like uh, uh, global icons, like uh, CEO of Google, uh, you know, CEO of Apple. Uh, you know, people who are really, really smarter than than me even. And, and the, on the flip side, this is also a prediction that within five years, if a company is not using AI, they are going to be dead. They are not going to survive because their competitors are going to be so further ahead. The survival of the company will be questionable. If they don't embrace AI, they'll be out of business? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. And I suppose there have been various technologies along the way that have come the same way that companies had to embrace them. Yeah, I mean, look at uh, Kodak, look at, you know, Blockbuster. They refused to use the technology. What happened? So, mm. I mean, there is no right or wrong decision, but the choice is there. It's it's about survival or or prosperity. So, of course, fear of the unknown, fear of uh, especially how AI has been depicted in uh, Hollywood that all plays into our psychology, but at some point you have to get over that fear and say, okay, let me look into this at least and see what the whole, um, you know, excitement is about and then take baby steps to embrace a little bits and pieces here. And when you start to experience the benefits, then it becomes easier to, you know, take the next step and the next step. So there are ways to like overcome that fear, just like anything else in life. But if you give into that fear and totally become resistant, you are working against your own self-interest. Is there or should there always be an off button? And I'm thinking of, you know, sometimes the AI just isn't doing what you want and you want to, okay, shut down and program. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's simple. I mean, just in case of AI, it is that simple. Just turn it off, you know, just unplug the machine and it'll go away. It's not something that is, uh, you know, that, that is uh, like a living creature that, that we have uh, created that uh, now is going to take over the world or anything like that. At the end of the day, it is a program running on a machine that can be switched off. 
Mm, so we we're not creating a Frankenstein monster that's that's running around the village scaring the villagers. There has not been a single technology created by humans that can fall into that category, right? If you think about it. It's just that the distortions we create, the narratives we create, that's what scares people, not the technology itself. I mean, even if you look at, you know, atomic bombs, hydrogen bombs, I mean, initially the research was based on how to extract energy and understand the fabric of the universe. How do we exist? How, what is mass? What are these particles? How does existence work? And along the way, they discovered, oh, if you break the atom into, you know, uh, its components, it releases a lot of energy and that can be used in our, uh, you know, daily life. And uh, some of that was done, but by and large, uh, it was made to, you know, uh, nuclear energy was made to uh, create these weapons. So it's, it's our doing, it's our desire to take over the world and what have you that sort of distorts this technology. And a lot of people say, okay, in that case, even like AI can be used by bad people. But again, you have to understand even with nuclear bombs and other bad things, there are a handful of people who can use these technologies for mass destruction, but the balance in power lies in enormous amount of good people who are keeping those bad actors in check. Right. And that's what we have to do with AI as well. Like we have to put in regulation. We have to make sure that, the, you know, the, it's being used for uh, good purposes. If, if somebody uses for bad purpose, then again, we can use AI itself to fight against that bad implementation. And not only that, here is another thing that I got into a discussion with. Like, if you think about who are those bad people, I mean, generally there are 5% of the bad actors in society who want to do harm. And they're not doing harm because they're inherently bad human beings. They have gone through some traumatic experiences in their life, suppression and, uh, you know, uh, like things have been taken away from them, which creates this desire in them to get even with the rest of the world. Right. And that's why they use these technologies to harm other people. But if you can use this technology to sort of help everyone, uplift everyone, eventually, I hope one day we will have no such problem as some human has a desire to destroy somebody else, you know? Mm. Manoj, for people who might want to learn more about you or connect with you, is the best way to find you on LinkedIn? Yes, yes. Okay, you, that's Manoj Agaround. You can find that link in the description below. As we prepare to wrap up, if you could sit down with a business leader and get them thinking more constructively about AI, what one, two, or three questions would you recommend that they ask themselves on perhaps a regular basis? Sure. Well, the, the first one is, okay, what are your goals for the next six months? You know, where do you want to be? Because every business leader has a plan, has a strategy in mind. They, they want to hit certain goals in terms of revenue, in terms of growth or whatever it is. And then ask them, what is the biggest hurdle in getting there? What is the biggest domino that needs to fall for you to get there? Now, if the third question is, if you can make it happen 10 times faster, 10 times cheaper, 10 times easier, will you be interested in some technology like that? Mm, excellent advice. My guest today is Manoj Agarwal, reminding you that if your business is not using and investing in AI, you're not going to be in business for a long time. If you like what you heard, tell your friends and post your five-star review on Apple Podcasts because that helps more listeners find us. Come back every week for more practical insights to help you deliver your intended message. I'm your host, George Torok. <music>